I think it would probably be good to go ahead and get started. All right. Well, thank you for uh, joining every uh, 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 joining us tonight, everybody. Um, tonight, uh, be kind of talking about shoulder arthritis. Uh, it's difficult to talk about shoulder replacement without kind of talking about some of the other maladies of the shoulder. So I'll I'll briefly touch on uh, each. But um, uh, so uh, focus uh, this evening is shoulder replacement, and the indication for a shoulder replacement is when you've worn out the shoulder joint and you have a frankly arthritic joint. Um, I'm uh, Max Sider. I'm uh, the newest uh, surgeon at uh, Vail Summit Orthopedics coming up on a, uh, a year of being with the group. I, I was specifically brought in for shoulder replacement on top of uh, shoulder, hip, and uh, knee surgery. Um, so, uh, so shoulder pain in general is normally what is going to bring somebody into the clinic when they have uh, shoulder arthritis. Uh, shoulder pain, uh, of course, can have a lot of different associations. Uh, stiffness, which is loss of a, a range of motion. Uh, weakness uh, and it, accompanying weakness, maybe a, a possible loss of active motion that you may still have uh, range of motion, but aren't able to uh, elevate your shoulder with your own muscles. Uh, mechanical symptoms. Uh, these are things like the clicking, popping, crunching inside the joint that you may feel as the joint is kind of wearing out and you're losing a little cartilage. And then uh, um, something that we always key on within orthopedics is loss of function. Just uh, are you able to do uh, the things that you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, your leisure activities, uh, all the fun stuff that we like to do out here in the mountains. And then um, uh, sensory changes are something that we kind of worry about uh, as, oh, is this potentially coming from the spine? Because, you know, not all pain in the shoulder is actually coming from the shoulder itself. So uh, this is something that we uh, focus in on and make sure that we're not missing something else. Uh, common causes of shoulder pain. Uh, so rotator cuff tears, very common here, especially in a very active population. Uh, this uh, accompanying rotator cuff tears is bursitis, which is inflammation of a little uh, fluid sac over the uh, uh, tendons that allows smooth tendon gliding. Um, and then the end stage of rotator cuff tears, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, is rotator cuff arthropathy. Uh, that is when the joint is worn out from a lack of a rotator cuff tissue. And uh, that is one of the reasons why people have a shoulder replacement with a specific type of replacement that I'll get to. Uh, biceps pathology. Uh, everybody knows the biceps is right here. But uh, actually, that tendon goes up into the shoulder. So it's very common that that's coexistent with other shoulder pathology, whether it's rotator cuff issues or um, arthritis. And then uh, cartilage lesions, which is kind of what we're focusing on today, because that's what arthritis is, is loss of that smooth uh, articulation surface of the joint, which is cartilage is a very smooth, frictionless surface. Once we start wearing that away is when we start to get arthritic problems. Um, focal cartilage lesions uh, are, uh, can be treated in other ways. Generalized cartilage lesions are arthritis, and those are things where we talk about uh, conservative measures and then ultimately joint replacement once it gets bad enough and uh, people's pain or function is poor enough. Um, labral tear is very common. I won't really talk, talk on them tonight. Uh, it's more of a instability issue, uh, something that we see in uh, some of our kind of younger patients, uh, 30s around that uh, after a shoulder dislocation uh, or other kind of subtle instability. And then AC joint pathology, we pro all probably know somebody who has a little lump up here on the shoulder after having a uh, shoulder separation. Uh, that is also a form of arthritis, but uh, we don't think about, uh, it, it, that's not a shoulder replacement arthritis. That's, a, that's something where we can just shave out the joint because it's such a small little joint. Um, so range of motion loss as well, uh, just uh, these are the two big presenting symptoms, right? So very similar coexistent symptoms, pain, weakness, mechanical symptoms, loss of function, and maybe a history of a dislocation uh, without treatment. Um, again, uh, pain, stiffness, those are the two biggest uh, symptoms in arthritis. And then we'll talk about kind of the weakness that accompanies rotator cuff arthropathy. So um, <clears throat> with... Uh, 
the loss of a shoulder range of motion stiffness, you know, there's stiffness where you can't move your own shoulder, right? You can't lift it up. And uh, there's also stiffness where you're just not able to elevate it on your own. And we call that a pseudo paralysis, uh, where actually you can lift up the shoulder on its uh, uh, with your other hand, right? So that's the loss of active range of motion versus the loss of passive range of motion. Uh, shoulder arthritis is what we're focusing on here. But anytime I see you in clinic for something like this, I'm thinking about, are there other reasons why this is happening? Do you maybe have a frozen shoulder where uh, you've had a bunch of kind of sc uh, essentially scar tissue form around the shoulder that we need to work out with Josh and PT because the crux of treatment for that is physical therapy. That if, if I go in and replace your shoulder, I'm not going to make you better with a frozen shoulder. Uh, nerve impingement uh, can also lead to a loss of active range of motion. If it's bad enough, that is like impingement coming from the spine or there are nerves that come out here on the side of the shoulder that can also be impinged. And then tears of the rotator cuff, probably the Number one thing we're thinking about when we see an active loss of range of motion, especially if there's a common um, story, like, a, oh, I recently fell on some black ice right onto my arm. Now I can't lift it up. Well, you probably have a rotator cuff tear. And then uh, if that is uh, something that we don't treat uh, or, you know, at, maybe you compensated very well afterwards, years down the line we may be talking about a shoulder replacement for rotator cuff insufficiency um versus just doing the repair uh and then arthritis due to rotator cuff tears that's that's what i'm talking about there a neglected rotator cuff tear that causes a specific type of arthritis with a, a specific type of implant that we use to treat that um so again rotator cuff tears lead to a loss of active shoulder range of motion um Pain, weakness, normally pain radiating down the shoulder here may wake you up at night. Uh, problems with overhead activities or activities that are out away from the body. Um, and then passive shoulder range of motion loss. Uh, arthritis is a very common cause. Also, uh, when we're in our 50s, sometimes we get a frozen shoulder or if we immobilize the shoulder for some reason, uh, which is a really e extensive tightness of the joint. So something that we take radiographs, we examine, yeah, there's certain physical exam findings that I'm looking for uh, in each to really point me in one direction or the other, uh, although it's normally pretty clear. Um, and then so uh, all, all, with almost all orthopedic conditions, our first line of treatment is conservative management, right? We don't want to be knife happy. Uh, we want to try to make people better with uh, avoid, having them avoid the need for surgery. Although, you know, some people have a surgical issue. Um, so uh, the physical therapy for early arthritis in the shoulder is extremely effective. Uh, it really helps people uh, get much better function. It's not going to change the fact that you have arthritis, but it's going to give you a very functional shoulder uh, and allow you to uh, hopefully avoid a shoulder replacement or really uh, extend the life of that native joint. Anti-inflammatory medications are one of the big things in our armentarium. Uh, those are NSAIDs, uh, which are like ibuprofen or Aleve. Uh, and they're a uh, first line treatment for anybody with a uh, shoulder arthritis issue. And then steroid or biologic injections. Um, some people will tell you, uh, and not anybody in our group, but some people will tell you that uh, a biologic injection may regrow your cartilage. Uh, we do not have any evidence that that occurs. Uh, the best thing that we know is there may be some regenerative potential from some biologic injections. Biologics are like PRP or bone marrow aspirate concentrate, if you've heard of those. Um, PRP comes from your own blood. Uh, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, we take some bone marrow and spin that down to get the stem cells out of the bone. Um, those things may have some healing potential, but we generally think of them more like an anti-inflammatory, which is what a steroid is when we're injecting into the joint. We're cooling down the inflammation in that joint and hopefully really allowing you good success with physical therapy. That anybody who I'm injecting with a steroid, I send them with a physical therapy prescription because that's the real crux of the treatment there is the therapy, right? The steroid jump starts things and does help with the pain, certainly, but uh, allowing a very successful therapy treatment is what my goal is with a steroid injection or with a, a PRP injection. 
Uh, so biceps tendon pain is normally in the front of the shoulder. And the biceps tendon is something that we're going to treat any time that we are doing a shoulder replacement. Um, so uh, biceps tendon pain, you may notice it when you're flexing the elbow. Uh, and um, in general, it is just, you can actually palpate your biceps tendon right here, like your deltoids, big muscle on the side out here. Biceps tendon is right in this groove here. And even in myself, I don't, I don't have a biceps tendon issue, but it, you know, it kind of hurts to flip it back and forth a little bit. But biceps tendon is a very common bad actor, whether it's uh, with a rotator cuff tear because the biceps tendon runs so close to the rotator cuff, or whether it's in the setting of arthritis because the biceps tendon gets beat up and torn. And in both of those things, we generally, um, again, treat it first conservatively, but uh, surgically will reattach the biceps uh, during either of those procedures uh, to the top of the arm bone, uh, restoring that length tension relationship. So the biceps functions normally, but we take out that disease part of the tendon that is the big pain generator right up here. You can see it takes like a 90 degree angle into the shoulder. So that tortuous angle is just one of the things of our anatomy that that biceps tendon is pretty vulnerable and likes to uh, uh, act up. Uh, so this is just showing a biceps tendon uh, treatment. Uh, this is something if I'm replacing the shoulder, it's one of the first things I do because on the way into the shoulder joint, as you can see, the biceps tendon here, which is torn in this picture right there, uh, is overlying the, the joint. So we will actually snip that right here and then suture it down to the bone and reattach it into the bone. Um, sometimes people just cut the biceps tendon, which is a fine treatment that can lead to some cramping in the uh, uh, biceps. Uh, so generally I don't prefer it. Also leads to a, a, a little less cosmetic uh, outcome that you can get a little Popeye deformity, which is just a, a little more balled up biceps down here. And uh, the, uh, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's the rundown on the biceps here. And uh, rotator cuff pain. Uh, so uh, generally rotator cuff pain, people will, uh, uh, Pretty much same with arthritis will complain of some pain that may awaken them from sleep. Uh, the difference between a rotator cuff and arthritis, normally you have full preserved strength with arthritis. Rotator cuff, you're going to have some decreased strength, uh, maybe more pain with like lifting up a can or something like that maybe a little heavier, like a milk jug. And again, the, this can be insidious. It can be a wear and tear type injury, or it can be associated with trauma. Uh, arthritis is all, always essentially associated with an insidious onset that, you know, the shoulder just hasn't been working quite right. And then it's getting worse and worse because arthritis is a wear and tear condition. Um, so rotator cuff tears, we like to get to them early. Uh, there is a very successful treatment with uh, physical therapy that uh, several papers have shown that if you don't have an acute tear, uh, that it's something that we can send you off for PT. And uh, that uh, if you do have an acute tear, those are ones that we like to fix up. Like if you fell in the driveway and all of a sudden you can't lift your arm up, right? Because we know that tendon is going to retract. So we want to get it fixed up so that we get a good repair and a good outcome for you long term. One that's kind of been there for a while, the success with uh, physical therapy runs somewhere around 80% of people avoiding surgery on those. Um, a big time neglected tear though, one that is torn and then retracted back here. If you can see my mouse cursor, that's the uh, distance they retract. Sometimes we have to do something called a superior capsular reconstruction, or if there's some arthritis in the joint, we then replace the joint with a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. And I'll get to that here in a second. Um, so uh, surgery for range of motion loss uh, is uh, essentially the ones that I've underlined are the ones that we're doing for arthritis here, right? That, uh, okay, I've kind of touched on the rotator cuff. A nerve decompression is pretty rare, but uh, sometimes we'll see uh, nerve compression in the shoulder and we'll have to treat that. Uh, but uh, I'm about to get to uh, what we call the comprehensive ar arthroscopic management procedure, as well as the uh, two shoulder replacements here. Um, so the arthro, uh, oh, sorry, I've got one more slide in between the two, it looks like. So um, x-rays, very helpful when we're diagnosing arthritis, because as I was saying, uh, you could have a frozen shoulder, right? There could be something else going on that is leading to the 
pathology in the shoulder. And arthritis is a clinical and radiographic diagnosis that there's very typical findings that we see on an x-ray in an arthritic joint. We'll see a big bone spur here on the bottom. This is actually an MRI, but uh, we'll see narrowing of the joint space. And then these white spots here are actually little cysts. And that's where the bone, uh, there's so much inflammation in the joint that it starts eroding into the bone here a little bit and gets replaced with some fibrous tissue. If you actually scoop that out with a curette, it looks like jelly. Uh, so it's not normal bone anymore. Um, and then this is like the top view where uh, there's no uh, significant joint space left here. Uh, there's some wear on the back of the uh, socket of the shoulder. The socket is called the glenoid. Um, and so those are the things that we see in our arthritic joint. And this person is going to have limited range of motion, a lot of sandpaper type feeling when they're moving the shoulder and uh, a painful motion, uh, maybe some weakness, right? That uh, you, you can have weakness that's more pain inhibition than frank weakness because the tendons aren't working. Uh, so options for this, uh, again, A, first off is always physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, plus or minus an injection. Um, and then once that is not having an effect, because generally that'll work uh, quite well for a bit. Um, and then sometimes people are like, I'm tired of this, my shoulder hurts, uh, let's do something more definitive, right? And so uh, in general, when you have shoulder arthritis, I'm gonna recommend a shoulder replacement. That's the definitive treatment for arthritis. We don't have anything that regrows cartilage. Uh, so the solution for arthritis is replace the joint with metal and plastic. Um, some people, however, do not want to have their shoulder replaced. And uh, so, oh, I've got one more slide here on the shoulder arthritis. So this is just showing the x-rays here. Again, narrow joint space, subchondral sclerosis is hardening of the bone. Osteophytes are bone spurs that you should have a smooth Gothic arch through here. And this person just has some large bone spurs here. And then some cyst formation around the humeral head, as well as a flat humeral head. Over here, you can see this is like a um, square peg in a round hole, right? That you should have a smooth surface for this. This joint looks beautiful, that you should be able to uh, articulate that joint and move your shoulder around. Um, so uh, everybody wants to know, how did I get arthritis? Well, normally it's a multifactorial thing, pretty stuck. Um, and uh, so the um, uh, normally arthritis is, uh, there's no known necessarily cause, there's genetic causes. Uh, people who have had a bunch of shoulder dislocations, those sort of things are at risk for arthritic formation. Um, and then uh, um, frequently it's just, well, you're just kind of high-end user and you wore out the joint essentially. Um, and so the arthroscopic treatment of uh, arthritis, this is um, something that I'm doing that is newer. Uh, not a lot of people are doing this. Uh, and uh, uh, we have pretty good results on this, uh, about a 60% survivorship at 10 year follow-up in the correctly selected patients. So what that means is 60% of people who had this procedure done did not need a shoulder replacement 10 years down the line, despite the fact that they know they have shoulder arthritis. That's pretty good if you're looking to avoid a joint replacement and we know, hey, really the only option is a joint replacement. Uh, so what we do here is we go in minimally invasively, we go in with the camera and the arthroscope there, uh, as well as use an X-ray to remove a bone spur on the bottom of the head and then do a large capsular release around the shoulder. I'll also reattach that bicep and clean up over the rotator cuff anytime I do this in anybody. Um, the upside of this is, okay, you preserve your native joint. The downside is you're probably gonna need another surgery in the future. So it, it's not my first line recommendation for people, but some people are like, really don't want a joint replacement. And I, I, you know, I, I want another option. Um, and I think this is a great option. Like I, uh, I have somebody I just saw today who I did this on two weeks ago. Uh, her, she had a range of motion to about here beforehand. Now she's got almost a full range of motion, um, almost ready to go back golfing. So I, I don't limit people after this procedure. I just let the swelling go down. We're not waiting on anything to heal. We're just taking out some bad and saying, hey, hopefully we get some more life out of the shoulder. And uh, so 
joint replacement is um, uh, a wonderful procedure for somebody who needs it. That uh, as a joint wears out, a lot of people are able to function with arthritis. And then eventually there will be a kind of drop off point where it's like, this is too bad. I can't sleep. I can't, you know, uh, lift my grandchildren, et cetera. Uh, th those sort of things that are, uh, it's no longer something I can tolerate. Um, so uh, this is where we go in and replace the shoulder joint with metal and plastic. We make a cut across the humeral head to remove the um, joint here and uh, replace it with a metal stem that goes down the center of the humerus and a metal ball up on top of the uh, shoulder joint. And then on the glenoid, which is the socket side, we resurface that and put a high strength piece of plastic in there to create a nice smooth bearing in there. We also do a big capsular release because the shoulder will be tight and the capsule will have scarred and tightened down over the course of many years of arthritis uh, to get that nice full range of motion back and then reattach the biceps on there. Um, generally, the results of uh, shoulder replacement are extremely reliable. Uh, it's generally the last surgery that you should need on your shoulder. Yes, we do worry sometimes about like the components loosening, other, uh, things like that. But generally, there's about a 90% survivorship of a shoulder replacement that most people never end up needing to have that worked on again. Um, and then uh, generally excellent long-term improvement in pain. I always tell people this is not going to be the same shoulder you were born with, right? It's not uh, the native joint, but it's a very good joint compared to what we had uh, before. Um, and then rotator cuff arthropathy is uh, uh, the uh, issue I've been kind of dancing around here where you have a big long-term rotator cuff tear and it's kind of maybe it wasn't symptomatic. Uh, maybe you knew you had it and you didn't want anything done with it. Maybe you had a rotator cuff repair and that failed. Uh, eventually that causes superior migration of the humeral head, meaning that the arm bone comes up in the shoulder and kind of hikes up into the shoulder joint. So you can see here that this ball, that Gothic arch that I talked about earlier is off, right? So it's way up here and you're actually forming a false joint with the top of the shoulder blade here. And we call this um, acetabularization, which is just a fancy word for meaning you're making a false joint up here on the top of the shoulder joint. Here you can see a big rotator cuff tear that's retracted back. Um, if there's no arthritis and we think we can repair this, we'll talk about a repair. But in general, if I saw this x-ray and I saw this MRI, I'd say you need a reverse total shoulder replacement, uh, which is a great piece of technology uh, for a tricky problem. Um, so this was available in uh, 2003 in the US. Uh, since it came out in the US, uh, it's given us a new option for a condition that otherwise we were handcuffed on, you know, that we were like, I can't do anything for you. Um, so with this, we uh, actually reversed the shoulder anatomy. We put the ball on what used to be the socket side. That's called a glenosphere. And that goes into the glenoid with high strength screws that really fix that in really nice. And then similar to the normal anatomic shoulder, we put a stem down the humerus and then Rather than having a ball on top of that stem, we have a cup. Um, so what that does is it allows the deltoid and then some of the other muscles. We have a muscle here, uh, which is two tendons called the conjoint tendon and the triceps to allow those to replace a lot of the function of the rotator cuff. It's not as perfect as an anatomic total shoulder because there is no rotator cuff, but does let people get up to uh, here, hopefully even higher. Um, but uh, it's a great option for somebody who needs it, right? Um, and uh, so uh, great results on these. A little less concerned about loosening because we've got great screw fixation with these. Um, and uh, that I, um, reverse total shoulder is very satisfying procedure to perform uh, because you really take somebody who is pretty crippled uh, due to their issue and give them excellent uh, function there. So this is just kind of a comparison between the two, right? We have the anatomic where the ball's on this side, the, the liner is on the socket side, and then it's reversed with the reverse. The ball's on the uh, cup side, 
And then we've got a cup here on what used to be the humeral head. Um, uh, hemiarthroplasty, where we do uh, the humerus only, is really for somebody who's had a fracture. Uh, I don't really do that for arthritis because the outcomes aren't as good, right? You're only replacing half of the uh, resurfaced issue uh, or half of the um, issue uh, that is the problem at hand. And then joint resurfacing is... Uh, more of a, if you have a focal cartilage defect, you're young, we don't want to put an artificial joint in you yet, that we may try some something that's like kind of a little more experimental, to be frank, and uh, uh, put something in there like a little allograft over the uh, joint to try to uh, prolong the length of time before you need a shoulder replacement. Uh, rotator cuff repair recovery, I, in my opinion, is a little more daunting for patients than a uh, shoulder replacement recovery. Uh, that's because we lock you down in a sling and we have to wait for that rotator cuff tear to heal. It's a balance between restoring your function and getting healing. Um, so I, I generally expect at three months, people will be doing pretty well. But uh, at that point, really kicking it into gear, uh, getting all that strength back and, you know, Three months, sometimes people are coming in like, eh, I'm not feeling awesome. Six months is when they're <clears throat> generally really feeling great, I think, after a cuff repair. And you may continue to strengthen out for a year to even two years sometimes. Uh, and a shoulder replacement is pretty similar. Um, but since we are replacing the bad and putting in all new parts, we don't have to restrict you as much in the initial time period. Um, it is a bigger surgery. It's an open surgery versus an arthroscopic surgery. Uh, but in general, we'll start working on passive range of motion earlier. And then when I lift your sling restriction, which is normally at four or six weeks, we start working on the active range of motion. That doesn't mean it all comes back right away, but, uh, that, uh, at six weeks, we have lifted most of the restrictions. You're able to really aggressively get after things. At three months, um, everybody's different, right? So sometimes I have somebody coming in at three months who is absolutely destroying it. They are just doing amazing. And I'm like, I honestly don't really need to see you again because you're doing so well. Um, then sometimes I'll have somebody at three months who's still getting the full range of motion back, you know, still uh, early on in the strengthening. And that's okay too. That's normal. Everybody's body reacts a little different to a shoulder replacement. A lot of it has to do with what's the length of time that the problem has been existing before this. What was the condition of the muscles before we went in? Have we had any PT beforehand? So we're coming in with a really strong shoulder or are we coming in, you know, kind of at the lowest level and we're going to have to build it all up after we replace the shoulder. Um, and I'll turn it over to Josh here. Uh, let's see. Thanks, Dr. Sider. Um, did you want to answer any of those two questions or I guess kind of one and a half one there? I didn't know if you want to answer that before I get started or how you want to proceed. Um, I can do that. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, for some reason, it won't let me click this Q&A box. Let me try to get out of full screen and see if that helps. May I read it to you? Yeah. Uh, this one's from an anonymous attendee. I was diagnosed with a frozen shoulder and was in therapy for four months. Great success. I had dry needling and a cortisone. In the end, um, she was really happy, thought I was there and quit therapy. One month happy and now I feel it's going back to pain and many motions and at night. How can it be so good and then start to reverse? Uh, so that's not an uncommon story with a frozen shoulder uh, that we have kind of three different phases of the frozen shoulder. Uh, one is where it's early and inflamed. Then we have kind of a consolidation phase and then the phase where it kind of loosens up. It's not uncommon to have a little setback uh, when you are working on your frozen shoulder, especially because you really got to be on top of it every day um, that and even when you are uh, sometimes uh, it just wants to freeze back up. Uh, if, uh, you know, if you haven't had a steroid injection in three months, we can always give you another one and re help you restart the pain and then just get you back in for more PT. Sometimes it takes uh, like a surprisingly long time, nine months to a year to really have this totally settle down. And that's OK, right? that we know that uh, there's no quick solution for this, that I, we can't just go in and release the shoulder uh, because it's not as effective as the things that Josh does uh, with PT. 
I got another one for you from Sarah. Will a cortisone slash saline injection help slow the progress of frozen shoulder? PT doesn't seem to be doing anything for me after three months. And is the cortisone going to be degenerating for my shoulder? Uh, so I, people are always worried about, uh, and with good reason, uh, whether cortisone causes degeneration within the joint. I do not think that limited cortisone injections are going to cause significant degeneration. Uh, but uh, repeated cortisone injections over close intervals over a long period of time, yes, we do think they probably cause a deleterious effect on the cartilage. Um, in somebody who has established arthritis, I, I don't worry about that because the damage is done. Um, but uh, that if, if you have a good joint, we don't want to be injecting cortisone in it all the time. A, a single cortisone injection or two cortisone injections in order to help jumpstart your progress with PT, I think is a excellent adjunct of treatment with frozen shoulder because it is very painful. And the underlying uh, reason that you have a frozen shoulder is inflammation, right? So getting some anti-inflammatory in there should help uh, hopefully arrest a little of that progress. But the crux of treatment is just therapy and the tincture of time. Perfect. I think that's all the questions for now. Um, so yeah, I'm Josh, physical therapist here at, um, with Avalanche here in Breckenridge at the rec center. Um, we also have a facility at the hospital in Frisco and then one in uh, Silverthorne, which we may be getting a new place sooner than later, which would be awesome as well. A um, little background on me. Uh, I've been here for about five years, doctor of physical therapy, orthopedic certified specialist, champion sports specialist. Uh, I've been lucky enough to work with um, some of the you know Canadians and the UK for the X Games, and then I worked the World Championships and World Cup this year, which was uh, fun as well. We also do aquatic therapy here um, at the rec center. So if people are looking for a different way to um, kind of address some of their problems, we can do aquatic therapy um, as well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what we do in PT with, um, with basically total shoulder replacements. We've had a few other um, um, you know, webinars on shoulders. So, you know, I was going to focus more on the total shoulders. Um, so basically, you know, we're starting off, we're going to do a lot of passive active range of motion, um, trying to get that scapulohumeral rhythm back where, um, you know, you can lift overhead. That can be pretty tough. Um, Dr. Sider talked about that, um, where you kind of get that humeral rise and then you kind of get stuck here and you see a lot of this kind of compensation. So there's a lot more coordination in the shoulder than honestly most other joints. So that gets a little tricky and can be a little disheartening um, initially, but it's important to be able to get that coordination back um, before you really get a lot of overhead strengthening. Um, you know, depending on what's going on, we can do some taping, we can do um, some dry needling, typically six to 12 weeks after surgery um, is when we do that. And then for the early phases of your recovery, the main thing we're gonna work on um, prevent the shoulder from contracting and decrease the pain. Um, the nice thing with um, after a total shoulder or reverse total shoulder is usually um, the pain doesn't last too long. Usually Dr. Siders takes care of that pretty quick, which in that itself is amazing. People can get back to, you know, sleeping on it, living a normal life, but then it's our job to kind of get that thing more functional. Um, so you guys can do a lot more than just, you know, survive. Um, general contraindications, precautions, you know, it definitely depends on the severity of the shoulder beforehand. Um, so don't, don't take these as um, absolutes, um, but usually stay around four weeks. And then we begin active range of motion around um, four weeks as well. So the first part of the healing phase that I like to call it is it's kind of a boring phase. It's kind of letting us do a lot of the work, trying to get that shoulder moving um, and getting that pain down. And then also starting to get those muscle activated and learning how to um, to work again. I mean, with the um, reverse total shoulder, they've actually moved, you know, the muscles are doing different things now than they were before, and some aren't connected. And so you got to really retrain the shoulder on um, how to start working in this, this new method. Um, and then there's just some range of motion guidelines that are pretty typical. Um, phase two can last anywhere for around four to 12 weeks. Um, and that's when we're introducing that active range of motion, uh, restoring the scapular humeral rhythm and the pain-free motion. Um, you can kind of see in this um, picture, it's your shoulder is kind of a roll or it's a golf ball and a tee. So it's, you know, a lot of mobility in the shoulder, but not a lot of stability. So you have this roll slide mechanism. So as you're raising up, 
if your humeral head just keeps rolling up, then you're going to get that that impingement on top. So we got to work on getting that rotator cuff, those scapular stabilizers to kind of pull pull you down, get that good um, congruency within the glenohumeral joint. And so that's a big part of um, getting you up and overhead. So like I said before, that can be a little frustrating, um, but once you get that motion back, um, then it's really getting a lot of strengthening back and, and you can kind of heal up pretty quickly. Um, and then the final phase, around 12 weeks or so, um, you know, get more strengthening in. And you can do light strengthening before, but this is where we really start um, getting the strength back introducing quicker, more powerful motions, and then, you know, return to sport. So, you know, you might not throw that hundred mile fastball anymore, um, but we can get you to a very active lifestyle. Um, you know, overhead sports are going to be a little more challenging. Um, but honestly, you can, the way shoulders are places that have, I've been working for 10 years from the first time I started working to seeing them now, it's, it's amazing how quick um, people get back. I saw one of Dr. Sider's shoulders, and now he's done a few months ago, but you know, he's back in the rec center. He's working out. He's pushing weight pretty hard now and I'm um, doing a lot of overhead motion. And this is the best he's felt honestly in years. So um, pretty exciting stuff with the new technology and how these shoulders are going. Um, obviously the best thing is we, we'd like to prevent these surgeries as long as possible. Um, but you know, sometimes it, you just can't, um, and, you know, you come to PT, we try to do what we can to get the cortisones, you get the PT um, and we see what we can do. And we hope to to heal you um, conservatively, but you know sometimes that doesn't happen, and that's why it's great to have surgeons like Dr. Sider here, so he can, you know, take over, fix you up, and then we'll get you back in PT and, and get you back to all the amazing activities we have out here. So yeah, kind of with the prevention, making sure you have full active range of motion, making sure the muscles are strong. Um, a lot with those scapular stabilizers and rotator cuff muscles, um, you don't see it as much up here because a lot of people don't lift to get um huge muscles up here that lift more for their their sports to be ready for um but you can have those muscle imbalances where a lot of your your bigger muscles your your pecs your delts um your traps all those are really strong and then your rotator cuff scapular stabilizers um they aren't as strong so you have those muscle imbalances and the body doesn't like imbalances so we try to even those out for you and then one of the best ways to do is avoid trauma but sadly that just happens up here with all the fun sports we like to do so you know what can you do but um, yeah, I'd love to open it up to any questions you guys have and um, kind of go from there. Let's see. Um, Dr. Sutter, are you able to read these now or do you want to read them off? Oh, I think you're on mute still. Yeah. Okay. There he is. Um, and uh, yeah, I can see them now that I'm not sharing. So how long is the recovery following the scope? Uh, so it depends what you're having done arthroscopically, right? That uh, if you're having a rotator cuff repair, that's a, a much different story than if I'm just going in and doing what we call this comprehensive arthroscopic management procedure. Um, that rotator cuff repair, I, I generally do expect a full six months for you to be 100%. Um, three months feeling pretty functional, but uh, full six months uh, to be back to like tenets, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, but with this, uh, the scope arthritis procedure, which we call a comprehensive arthroscopic management. Uh, so the only thing that I'm waiting uh, to heal is a biceps uh, uh, tenodesis. Normally I restrict somebody's flexion, uh, resisted flexion for about a month to six weeks. After that, because we want that biceps tendon to heal down where we've repaired it to, and that uh, resisted flexion is what causes um, tension across that biceps. The rest is uh, the recovery. I, I, I guess it depends what, what you want to quantify as recovery, because I may have somebody who is doing great, but still working with PT, right? Because you're still recovering. You want to keep that range of motion that we got in the operating room. So I do expect work with PT for, you know, probably three months after the surgery. But for example, you know, and this is just anecdotal, I uh, saw somebody 
two weeks after the surgery today and she is ready to play sports. And I had to pump the brakes on her a little bit because it was like, well, you gotta let this biceps heal. Um, but, uh, she was feeling great. And, you know, uh, she was like, man, my range of motion's already so much better. I'm still working on it with PT, but, uh, that, that was, uh, you know, that's been her course. And that's generally what I expect is a quick recovery. That's the reason to do it. Otherwise you should just have your shoulder replaced and, and go for the full thing. Um, and I see, uh, anonymous, uh, any at home PT do to do that is safe without compromising an injury further that hasn't been clinically diagnosed. I think most, uh, physical therapy, uh, interventions that you're going to do are relatively benign. The concern about having an undiagnosed injury is like, oh gosh, if you had a dislocated shoulder that was still out of the joint and you didn't know it, or if, uh, you know, that, a lot of things, like if you had a big rotator cuff tear after a fall, that's what we call an acute tear, right? That's something that we want to fix early because we want you to preserve that rotator cuff. Um, but most things actually you can start up with, and this is how most people do, I think, is you can start up with some of your home PT or, you know, Colorado is a state where you actually don't need a physician's referral to get in to see Josh and the physical therapist. So you can self-refer in and, and they uh, also are very skilled in diagnosis and evaluation. Uh, so, you know, he's both he and myself physical exam is the majority of what I'm basing my diagnosis off. The uh, x-rays are very helpful adjunct, right? But uh, that going in and, you know, uh, just getting a PT visit with Josh, having him help you with a home exercise program, I think is a great step, honestly. And uh, I think it's a totally reasonable first step. Um, yeah, uh, oh, and I'll let Josh go. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just to piggyback on that. Um, yeah, I mean, without looking at you, you know, you kind of wanted to stay the pain free, but you also don't want to just hold your shoulder down by your side for the next six weeks. Um, that, you know, a lot's not known about how frozen shoulders happen, but one of it is, you know, have an injury and then you don't move it for a while because you think you're helping it. And then by the time you try to move it, everything's locked in. Um, but we also do um, kind of free screens and they're pretty quick, you know, five, 10 minutes, whatever. But in that amount of time, we can kind of see like, okay, yeah, this is something that's not too serious or it's like, oh no, you want to go um, you know, see your doctor for that. So that can be a nice option too, to kind of get in a, a quick look and it's, um, you know, you don't have to commit too much time for that. Absolutely. And, uh, anonymous, I see you asked, uh, does posture have a lot to do with shoulder rehab and PT? I, I certainly, uh, that, you know, uh, your scapular mechanics have so much to do with your overall shoulder function. And I think scapular mechanics is what a lot of us think about as posture, other than, you know, if you're slouching in your low back, right, that sitting with that pinned back shoulder position uh, that uh, as after when somebody is immediately post-operative, they are going to want to hunch like this. And I mean, Josh sees it every day, right, uh, that uh, everything wants to shut down around the shoulder. So restoring that scapular mechanics, all that periscapular strength. Uh, it has a ton to do with that. And I'll let Josh take it a little further from there because he's the expert, honestly. Yeah, I mean, when, when you're coming back, especially from surgery, that's a huge thing, just kind of that guarded posture. Uh, we kind of talked about that too with kind of working on getting your arm overhead um, to get that posture. But also additionally, you know, a lot of people now are working from home. So technically, if you're working on your laptop, you can't be ergonomically correct because the top of your computer screen is supposed to be at your eye level. And then your arm should be, um, they should be straight out with your wrist straight. So unless you have a really short torso or a really tall laptop, it's really hard to, uh, to get in that posture. And that can tend to get you into more of that forward posture, which closes down that subacromial joint. Um, and then over time, it's not usually going to happen quickly, but if you're working in this position for five, 10 years, you know, that wears on you. And when I used to work in San Jose, California, you know, with the tech capital of the world, there's a lot of shoulder impingements, um, due to just being in that position for a long period of time. And uh, let's see, did I leave anybody off there? I think that's everybody. Um, all right, guys, well, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, if there's no further questions, I won't take up any more of your time. Um, always a pleasure to do these. Thanks so much for being here, Josh. I really appreciate your input. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sider. Thanks, everybody. Oh, oh we got one more here. 
Um, and uh, so, uh, hey, Wayne, how you doing, buddy? Um, so I, I uh, see uh, you're asking about the recovery. Um, so uh, a little more detail on the recovery that um, the shoulder, uh, so the initial surgery, we use a little nerve blocks. Uh, that helps quite a bit with the initial pain, right? That uh, most patients I think are able to go uh, on to straight on to Tylenol, although we always prescribe some oxycodone for breakthrough pain. Um, the uh, first few weeks are just working with Josh on passive range of motion, trying to get that shoulder moving again, maybe a little gentle active uh, because we're not as worried about the rotator cuff uh, with a reverse replacement because you don't have a rotator cuff there, right? Um, and then after four weeks, once we totally relieve you of the sling, that's when the hard work starts with getting that active range of motion, which is, you know, the difficult portion. Um, and then at about three months, I generally expect you to have a, a near full active range of motion, maybe still getting that polishing effect uh, of getting that terminal range of motion as we get a little stronger and everything else. But three months is when we really start going hard with the uh, strengthening and trying to recondition all those muscles that are now doing new functions uh, according to that. And I don't know if you have anything else to add there, Josh. Um, yeah, I mean, that basically sums it up. The, the main thing is trying to get that shoulder moving. Um, like I said, passively and keeping that pain down um, and then working on getting that good posture um, to kind of set you up for success. And then, you know, as we keep pushing forward, we can go, you know, get you back off, see what your goals are, what are you trying to get back to? And we'll just kind of keep working that route. But, um, but yeah, initially it's honestly, it's, it's a little boring for you. Everyone here is pretty active and you get put in a sling and you're not allowed to do a whole lot, but it's a very important to have that healing phase because, if you push it too soon, then things don't settle in the way you want it to, and you could have uh, bigger problems down the road. Yeah. And uh, GR, I see uh, you were told that a biceps tenodesis was recommended due to the biceps tendon having issues in the groove. Um, it sounds uh, reasonable. Um, it only hurts after shoveling snow. Uh, is PT an alternative? I read that the procedure is listed in dumb surgery alert. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure what dumb surgery alert is, but uh, I, 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 I always start off somebody with physical therapy, with especially with an isolated biceps tendonitis, uh, that the appropriate treatment in, in my mind, right? And I, I haven't met you. I never try to uh, talk poorly about another surgeon and their decisions because I don't, you know, you don't Monday morning quarterback because you don't know the full scenario. Um, but uh, that uh, I always start you off with conservative management. I uh, may offer you a steroid injection and then would always get you in for PT. Um, that doesn't mean that necessarily you won't end up wanting surgery that if you're like, eh, you know, the PT helped, but it's still hurting me. Like I can't shovel snow. Uh, then a biceps tenodesis is a, like the biceps tendon hurts. And it's a, it's, there's a reason why we treat it because it's a successful procedure. So I think it's actually a, a good surgery because it's, it's uh, you really take out the pathologic por portion. You don't change somebody's anatomy too much. And it's a very successful procedure in terms of pain relief. Um, and Ingrid, uh, can a PT choose Josh PT uh, if shoulder procedure was performed with Stebbin clinic physician? Uh, so uh, do you guys accept Aetna? Do you know, Josh? Yeah, we accept Aetna. Um, the one nice thing too, I mean, if you don't care about insurance at all, you can always choose whatever doctor or PT you want, but with insurance as well, I mean, as long as your insurance um, is covered, which we cover, I think pretty much every um, insurance, um, you know, it doesn't matter who your surgeon was or who your doctor is, you can kind of choose whatever PT you want to do. Um, and that's a nice thing. You know, you find somebody and you're like, hey, they were great. We just didn't drive together. You're like, oh, I actually... You know, we get to use the rec center for free when you go um, to the clinic here in Breck, like, you know, little things like that. But yeah, or it's close or whatever. But yeah, you don't have to, um, you know, you have the option to choose whoever you like. And we do accept Aetna. Um, and you're more than welcome to call into the clinic as well and talk to uh, one of our patient representatives. And they can actually uh, kind of give you a better idea of what it would cost, to, you know, co-pays, all that type of stuff. And uh, Carol, uh, so... Uh, a reverse shoulder replacement is 
uh, where we take out the arthritic portion of the joint um, and uh, replace the shoulder in a reverse fashion where we uh, actually go on and put the uh, ball side onto what used to be the socket and put the cup on what used to be the humeral head. And that allows for the deltoid to function where the uh, rotator cuff is deficient. And uh, um, it, uh, so it's a joint replacement, but uh, it's one that we tailor a little more towards uh, people with rotator cuff issues. All right, guys, uh, thank you all. And uh, if that's all the questions, I've got an eager dog that wants to play over here. Uh, <laughs> all right, thank you, Josh. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Y'all have a nice Guys, night. have a great night.